Okay, good evening, everyone. Um, and thanks for coming tonight for this uh, first and unprecedented collaboration between um, Columbia University Fashion Society and MELSA. Um, so um, this is the first talk um, to launch our political fashion series, which will be a series of talks throughout the year to talk about human rights and fashion through an inter interdisciplinary approach. So um, tonight we're going to talk about how to decolonize fashion. So we are going to talk about the power dynamics established um, and perpetuated into the production cycles and supply chains, but also through representation in the fashion industry and the symbolic of clothing. So please join me in welcoming our guest speakers, Kimberly Jenkins and Oda Katibi. So Kimberly Jenkins uh, graduated from the Parsons Schools of Designs and she has founded, um, she's a lecturer, researcher and consultant. Uh, she uh, has founded the Fashion and Race Database and she will talk to us more about it. Um, she's a steering committee member for the Research Collective for Decolonizing Fashion and an advisory board member for the Model Alliance. Um, Kimberly Jenkins teaches at the Pratt Institute and Parsons School of Design uh, where she has developed a course on fashion and race to provide a critical race theory of fashion. She has curated the exhibition Fashion and Race, Deconstructing Ideas, Reconstructing Identities in 2018. Last year, she received the award for Outstanding Achievement in Social Justice Teaching from the New School. She is also a consultant for Gucci to support their efforts on cultural inclusion and diversity. And um, Kimberly, I think you just got back from the Netherlands. Um, where you took part of a think tank uh, discussion on decolonizing fashion, objects and museum curatorial practice. And we are very lucky to have you before you move to Canada to teach at Ryerson, Ryerson. University. <laughs> okay, I, I said it. <laughs> um, and uh, Oda Katibi uh, graduated from the University of Chicago in 2016, where she researched uh, on the intersection of fashion, gender and the state in Iran. She's the creator of the website Juju Azad, which means free bird in Farsi. Um, and she's, um, and it's, it is a political fashion uh, platform to challenge, among others, orientalist mainstream um, representation in the media of Muslim women. She's the author of uh, Tehran Street Style. And you will talk uh, more about this book. Um, she's um, also, um, Sorry, she's the host of the hashtag Because We've Read, a radical international book club with over 30 chapters internationally. And she founded the Blue Teen Production, a co-op um, which is composed of women, uh, immigrants, and refugee. Um, it's a co-op uh, run by them. And um, I'm very curious to know more about this as well. Um, you will start a law school degree in 2020, <laughs> which is amazing. <laughs> um, and yes, so let's um, give another round of applause and let's start <laughs> to talk. So I'll first, uh, so I'll, I'll ask questions uh, to uh, Kimberly and Oda and then I'll leave the floor to you guys if you have um, questions. Um, I'll sit there maybe so you can see me. <laughs> That'd be great. <laughs> so I'll start with um with a very basic questions because for most people fashion is just either a sense of style or a way to, you know, put on some clothes because that's what you need to do. Um so how can you explain that fashion is so political? Well, um I'll start, I guess, um, from my teaching perspective. Um, I teach courses, uh, fashion history, fashion theory, the culture of fashion, essentially why we wear what we wear. And um, I think dress, the way we understand it in the field I come from called fashion studies, uh, clothing is the intermediary between the self or your body and society. Um, and so you work out who you are uh, and who you want to express um, and also you're working to kind of uh, grapple with how society perceives you uh, through um, 
the fashioning of your body, if you will, um, the way you dress yourself, the way you wear your hair, how you want to present yourself. Um, so that could be considered a political act. Um, when you are living in, which is my, my study and interest right now, a racialized body or a minoritized body or a marginalized body, um, that becomes particularly fraught. Um, dressing the body, making these everyday decisions, which may seem sort of benign, um, could be a matter of life and death. So wearing a turban, wearing a hoodie, um, can all of a sudden be a matter of life or death for one person and not for another. Um, so, so those are just some of the ways I think about um, dress being a political act. Um, but fashion also can be uh, a tool for empowerment um, and challenging the status quo, too, um, in a more act, uh, active and in even more intentional way than just sort of your everyday dress practice. Yeah, um, also, thank you so much for having me. I'm so excited to be on a panel with Kim, who is, like, fabulous and brilliant, and we had brunch once. Um, <laughs> I'm really excited to be here, and also, I love these questions. Um, I agree, obviously, with everything that Kim says, and I probably will also agree with everything that she says for the rest of this conversation, so I'm just going to not have to say that every time I start talking. <laughs> um, I think fashion is inherently political. Absolutely. Um, I think all art is political. There is no such thing as apolitical art. If anybody says that they're doing apolitical art, this Muslim condones violence, like, please cut, like, punch them in the face or something. That's like, that does not exist. All art is political because art is a mode of communication. It's something that you're able to really talk about, you know, different issues, question the status quo, um, think about things differently, heal, build something, imagine alternatives, or you're not, and you're silent. And silence is complacency. So you can sit and like paint flowers all day long, but that's still political because it's a comment on your privilege of being able to do so. And fashion is just the same. So fashion is art. We only don't see it as art because we live in a patriarchal world that doesn't value women's work, and historically the fashion industry is dominated by women. Um, but also, capitalism takes the value out of art. And it erases all of the complex ways and all of the, the intimacies of the hands that go into creating this piece of art. Um, and beyond just like our, the, the ways in which we dress as sort of um, being able to express, you know, if we wear like a MAGA hat, then like, you know, we're calling ourselves a racist, you know, things like that that are like obvious symbols. Um, also, when we think about fashion, it's inherently political because there's nothing else that literally frames your body, but also touches your skin. Like fashion is so intimate to who we are on a spiritual level, like for the Muslims in the room, Saddam, um, what does it mean for a hijab to be made in a sweatshop? Like, what does it mean that something that is like a representation of our morals and our understanding of ourselves is made by the, and like, in a sweatshop by other Muslim women? Um, or our clothes, like, what does it mean that our clothes that rub off on our skin every single day, and most nights, um, are made in a sweatshop, a product of violence? Um, and why do we never think about that? Like, why do we, we think about, like, what goes into our bodies, like what we eat and what we consume as, like, healthy or whatever, but not what goes on our bodies. But I think that's just as much, like, a very intimate decision and one that's also political. Um, because also, again, like, beyond, like, the tangibleness of it, when we even think about where our clothes are made, that's even another layer of political conversation that we can have. The fact that the majority of our clothes are produced in Southeast Asia, um, in countries that America has, like, completely colonized or the UK has and sort of these like these vacuums of imperialism and now the majority of it is consumed here in the West and so what does it mean that a shirt can cost five dollars and I think once we start even thinking about fashion as something that is inherently political and all of the trains that can come out of that I think we can also talk about imperialism and capitalism and race and all of these things that come with it too. Um, I will uh, follow up on what you just said, Oda, uh, that uh, most of the production takes place in Southeast Asia. Uh, actually, when you look at the supply chains, um, like most of the, um, the world trade routes from imperialistic time uh, remain today. So um, considering that the fashion industry today is a $3 trillion uh, industry and that 97% of our items are made overseas, um, can you tell us more about uh, slow the slow fashion movement and whether it is, according to you, um, a good solution. Do you want to start sure. with like, what you're doing with your work? And then I'll follow up with some ways that we talk about it um, in other, like, other ways okay. with a paradigm. Yeah, of course. Yeah. Um, 
This is a very good question. So I think that right now, something that we have to be thinking about when it comes to fashion and the capitalism and like the, the politics around it is that it doesn't come down to individual choice despite the fact that they want you to think that way. So people really right now want you to like buy the movement. You see like an ethical shirt and you want to like buy it and you feel like you're saving like refugee women. Oh my God. Um, but it's not like that. And it, you can't buy the revolution. And you can't buy a better world. Um, and so I think that we also have to push back a little bit from just this idea that, yes, there is an alternative to fast fashion. Um, and like there are brands that aren't engaged in like fast fashion. We can break that down in a second. But also, I do want to preface by saying that like that's the answer is not how like where we buy, but like how much we buy, and looking at systemic changes to how our clothes are produced. Um, so to give a bit of context, um, so I identify as an abolitionist which means that um, a, a abolition comes from a movement in the United States rooted in the slavery movement and the anti-slavery movement and anti-blackness and trying to eradicate anti-blackness and understanding that um, a lot of the systems that we occupy today require violence um, and that's rooted in anti-blackness. And so slavery is a really easy example because you can't reform slavery, right? It requires violence. You can like ask a slave owner to be nicer, but like that doesn't get rid of the violence of slavery. Um, so we have to get rid of the institution of slavery. Um, and so there are a lot of institutions today that we take for granted, just like slavery was, that also should be abolished. Um, and fast fashion is actually one of them. So fast fashion, there is no way that you can produce fast fashion ethically. Because fast fashion, the model of its production requires meeting 52 seasons a year, and there's also 52 weeks in a year, so that's a new season every single week, um, at quantities that are actually humanly impossible to produce. So um, there are quotas put for human garment workers in Cambodia and Indonesia and Southeast Asia that are actually known to be beyond human capacity, like 350 garments in an hour. Like you, you cannot actually physically at all do that. But when you have such a large quota because you have to fill this based on the needs of fast fashion, then you can insert violence into that equation in order to make garment workers move faster, beyond human capacity. So fast fashion, to meet this high demand, you have to use violence in order to make humans be able to get closer to like, this ridiculous production number. Um, so there's no such thing as ethical fast fashion. There's no such thing as sustainable fast fashion either. So H&M's sustainable collection means that they're using sustainable garments, but the amount of clothes that H&M produces is not sustainable. You can also have a sustainable line made in a sweatshop. So don't let that term throw you off. So I think all of that is like bullshit. We're adults here, right? Bullshit. <laughs> bullshit. Um, and so we have to think about what does an abolitionist perspective look like on the fast fashion industry? What does it look like to create a world in which our clothes are produced like literally soundly and ethically and like make you feel good about wearing it? Um, so the project that um, I'm working on right now called Bluten Production, which uh, do you, everyone knows those Danish Bluten cookies that your mother might have stored sewing. And I've never actually had one of those cookies. Um, I heard they're tasty, but I always get pinned <laughs> whenever I stick my hand in that. And so it's a, uh, basically the project is a homage to our mothers and aunts who have been doing this work for generations and generations. Um, but thinking about uh, sort of a holistic approach and a, systemically, a systemic challenge to fast fashion production. So we're an all women, immigrant and refugee one, uh, immigrant and refugee run clothing manufacturing company. So um, we produce clothes for designers around the world. And it's a workers cooperative. So everyone who works there also owns the business and gets to decide what clients we take on, how much their labor is worth. Um, there's no managers, so traditional factories uh, contracts takes about 2% goes to labor, but at our co-op, 80% goes to labor. Um, and so thinking about radical alternatives, not only to creating our clothes, but also just human work and like humans in a capitalistic environment. So yes, sustainability and fast fashion are not, they're not um, gonna work. And then added to that, um, how many of you have heard the term slow fashion? Um, so, um, so to contextualize it uh, as an educator, um, one way or sort of paradigm that we use in the fashion industry um, to compare um, how things are produced and how they're consumed is through the food industry. Um, so the food industry had kind of come out with this idea of slow food and artisanal movements, things that are organic. Uh, reading the labels, having this greater concern about how the food that you eat is made, uh, where does it come from, 
Um, is it nourishing? Does it have nutritional value? Um, is anyone harmed in the process? Uh, is it seasonal? Uh, so all of those things have been, that, that whole paradigm of thinking about the way we produce and consume food has been useful in the fashion industry. And we've been kind of borrowing some of those ideas and terms and uh, creating sort of a slow fashion movement and fast fashion, uh, where, as you can imagine, slow fashion involves um, more thoughtfulness in a holistic sense of where the uh, material comes from, where it's sourced, who makes it, um, the labor conditions for the people making your clothes on your back, um, and does the cost reflect that, uh, and then how we consume it, um, it, something that is more like timeless um, and carefully made as opposed to just churning out and reflecting all of the latest trends. Um, so again, something like Forever 21 so as, is a good example of that versus sort of a smaller boutique or a brand that um, makes things uh, in a more kind of timeless manner and more thoughtful um, where it's more human-centered. So, uh, so that's kind of where we come from with the uh, slow fashion movement. And it's definitely been co-opted, something that everyone wants a piece of to capitalize on. Um, you can't really believe every, everyone who's jumping on the uh, slow fashion bandwagon. And as you were saying, it, it involves having a holistic perspective, really kind of looking into all of these companies and considering when you go shopping, um, where the items were sourced, uh, what kind of materials are you wearing? Does it involve polyester, uh, which is nearly impossible nowadays to escape, um, which, is, which is plastic and leaves traces of plastic in the waterways every time you wash your clothes that are made from uh, polyester, um, which goes into the waterways and then we ingest it in the whole cycle of life. Um, so if you, if you eat seafood like I do. Um, so we've got that at stake. Um, and just thinking what else? In terms of fast fashion, I mean, it, it's also, as you were saying, just um, harmful in terms of the labor practices. Uh, you've got brands uh, with blood on their hands who um, have their work uh, outsourced and may not realize that the third party or the people who are overseeing um, the factory where they're having their clothes made um, are uh, practicing uh, very problematic conditions. So, um, so if you're the gap and you're thinking, well, we're not conducting harmful practices to, towards these employees or laborers, but there's this middle person who's managing the company or the, the factory there, and so they could have uh, problematic uh, pr practices and labor conditions. So, um, so yeah, that, those are just some of the ways that we could think about and consider uh, and be concerned about um, slow fashion versus fast fashion. And I also want to quickly add that, like a lot of those times, those like the reason why Gap doesn't know what's happening in their factories is like it's intentionally set up that way too. Like they don't want to know because they don't want to have that responsibility on their hands. It's not it's I looking think, the other way. Yeah, exactly. Gap doesn't actually. Gap knows that they're like you know have blood on their hands. They just they want to be able to have as much a distance as possible from that so that they can then go to the press and be like, oh, it's not our factory. Um, so actually, like there is an increasing number of regulations uh, to regulate, you know, businesses and their activities and their impact on human rights. Um, this was first, um, you know, in reaction to the 2013 disaster in Repsol Plaza, uh, which was a building that hosted uh, five garment industries and that collapsed, um, killing a thousand and a hundred um, garment workers and injuring more than two thousand uh, workers there. Um, it was. The, um, the impact was uh, enormous and this was mediatized, but this was not the first time this happened. Um, how, um, so now at the moment there is a, a draft treaty being uh, discussed in Geneva, the Human Rights Council, uh, to impose obligations on businesses and to you know, encourage them to respect human rights. How um, do businesses react to this uh, development of new norms? Um, Gucci, for example, uh, how, how do they react to this? How do you approach this in the Blue Team Co-op? I can't specifically speak on the businesses, but for researchers, there's a collective called the Union of Concerned Researchers, Fashion Researchers, and they're taking companies like H&M to task um, as of this week. <laughs> um, so, so we have that. Um, but I, 
I'm not sure. Um, so for Gucci, um, at least my work with Gucci, it was kind of involving issues with cultural awareness and sensitivity. And um, this week, and actually today, um, I helped write and draft a kind of a charter. It's a manifesto for diversity and inclusion for a Camera Moda, which is sort of like the CFDA of Italy. Um, and so it's kind of like this charter and 10 point plan that's going to pronounce um, how they, uh, really the standards and principles that they want to introduce in the fashion system and that, and that they hope all of their brands will follow uh, through on and that will affect um, HR and um, their colleagues, their consumers, um, I, I can't talk too much about what all the principles will be. Uh, it hasn't been published yet. Um, but I was invited to kind of draft that whole thing. And it's going to be signed ultimately by um, all the major Italian fashion brands. So Gucci, Versace, uh, Ferragamo, Valentino. They're, they're all on there. Um, I have less hope. <laughs> the brands that I work with, I'm not on Blue Tin, but I come from a community organizing background. Um, most of them are fast fashion brands. And right now, what the situation is and has been uh, is a sort of race to the bottom. And what that means is that um, these, basically, Nike is going to pull out of whatever factory they can to find a cheaper factory somewhere else. And so that factory owner knows that. And so a big, horrible practice that's happening right now that's very widespread is that the same factory owner, typically an investor from Japan or Korea, investing in creating a factory in Indonesia. Um, once garment workers have organized and raised wages or unionized, um, they will shut down that factory, leaving thousands of people without pay, without severance. Um, and then moving to somewhere else in Indonesia that the minimum wage is lower because minimum wage in Indonesia is based on geographic location and industry and where government workers are not unionized, it's further away from the city and then they'll reopen the same factory and then Nike will come back and work with them there. And so this is a really common practice um, and it's incredibly destructive because it really takes away all of the agency and the work that garment workers have done organizing and fighting against Nike, fighting against Gap and winning all these amazing campaigns just to have that whole factory factory closed down. Um, and so it is something terrifying because every win that we see is being taken away. Um, and this is happening on a really wide scale. Um, and we also, and I think that's just the labor side, like the, the fabric side of it is even more difficult to trace. Um, a report that's also just about to come out um, by the WRC, the Workers' Rights Consortium, is about to show that Nike raw materials are actually being harvested and processed by Uyghur Muslims in concentration and internment camps in Western China. And then sent to more Muslims in exploitative sweatshops in Indonesia to then assemble. And then sent over here with hijabs and Muslims are like, oh my god, yay. Um, Nike supports us. But Nike does not support Muslims. Um, and so I think it's really terrifying, especially when we get more into the supply chain, especially on the fabric end of things. It's a scary ass world out here. Like, we don't know where anything comes from. And there's a reason for that. Like, everything is so opaque. Wait, is opaque the clear one? <laughs> The, the opposite of opaque. It's really opposite of opaque out here. Um, and English was my first language, but I'm pretending like it wasn't. Um, but I, I, and I, and I think that it's really devastating because also these same brands will still sign agreements um, like the Fire and Safety Accord after the collapse of the Rana Plaza factory in Bangladesh. But that doesn't mean that anything is going to change. Um, it just means that they're going to get smarter about how they're framing things. It's going to, they're going to be smarter about coming, getting out of contracts for those of you who are at law school here um, and know that international human rights law has no teeth. Um, you can sign, but none of these contracts are actually binding. None of them actually do something if like, you fail to comply. Um, and Gap and H&M and Walmart and all of these big companies actually are very much removed from the entire process. So these factory owners um, are silencing garment workers. There's actually systems of retaliation in place for garment workers who speak out, both in terms of local press and even here. So um, an article that I was supposed to have published on Teen Vogue, actually I was paid a kill fee for, or offered a kill fee for, because um, it featured garment worker voices in Sri Lanka from working in H&M's sustainable factory. And once Teen Vogue saw how damning those interviews were, for legal reasons they killed the piece. So, it, there's not just like local sort of like repression on like the labor side. This is actually an entire chain of 
power that is really making sure that we don't hear garment worker voices or even think to even ask who's making our clothes. Um, so brands signing onto things is not really something that I think is the way forward. I do think that there needs to be systemic change on like an industry level. Um, and that's the only way that we can actually see something move forward. Um, there are some critics about uh, the sustainability movement in the way that it's unaffordable, basically. Like you're talking today to a bunch of students. Um, how do we adopt a sustainable um, way of, you know, dressing up um, while, you know, not ruining ourselves? I mean, there's various ways to do it. I do it all the time. I'm actually. I teach fashion history and theory, but I'm terrible for the fashion system. I don't really buy new clothes. I buy new shoes, underwear, athletic clothes, and that's it. And um, even athletic wear is difficult for me because a lot of it's just filled with polyester. Um, but I actually just wear uh, designer pieces, like meaning an emerging student or um, a local or emerging designer. Like a, a more established designer, emerging or <laughs> emerging student. It's like jumbo shrimp or something. So, uh, but like a, a student who's an emerging designer, um, or I'll wear an emerging designer's pieces, um, or I just love Beacon's Closet. I most of my closet is Beacon's Closet. So I wear secondhand and vintage. Um, I wear secondhand because it helps me reduce and just kind of stay out of the whole fashion cycle. Um, so I'm just kind of wearing other people's stuff. And then I love vintage because of the integrity of it in most cases, unless you're buying a bunch of 60s and 70s stuff, which has tons of polyester. But oftentimes, when you kind of look under the hood of these clothes, um, that's where you get like the real wool sweaters that now they're charging you like $600 for an artisanal or slowly made sweater um, at some boutique. Um, you can get like good Irish wool sweaters and as opposed to acrylic. Um, so I, so it, it's easy, but um, it's also a complicated solution. Um, so, so again, th the solutions that I'd propose would be just to redu reduce, first of all, and not get swept away in the whole fashion trend phenomenon um, and needing to keep up with everything. Um, not buying um, just basic like merch stuff, like when you go to a show or an event, just buying t-shirts everywhere. Or, or the Super Bowl shirt and all that stuff. Um, so, shirts. Yeah, it's just like merch everywhere. You just, you'd be surprised. Just so many places just have clothes for you to buy, T-shirts that are just $5 or so. Um, so just staying out of that, not allowing yourself to be tempted by that, and then also kind of recycling, so shopping vintage or um, secondhand. Um, but then a complication to that is not every culture, um, we take for granted that um, everyone should just go around wearing you know, recycled clothing or vintage, because in some cultures that's actually taboo. So um, I don't like to always tell my students um, who uh, that you should just wear vintage or secondhand clothing, because that could be offensive also in some ways. So, um, so there's got to be some sort of way that we can be more thoughtful about the way we shop, because right now many students say, well, what am I supposed to do? Go buy a $200 slowly made sweater? Um, something that is, you know, um, more thoughtfully made. Um, but that is an al alternative, you know, just spending more on less and just buying something intentional. Um, so, so those are just some solutions that I grapple with and that I think other people grapple with too. But I think the intimidating thing is um, it can be very classist, you know, to kind of wag your finger at people and say, you know, where's your sustainable wardrobe? Um, <laughs> you, you know, so... That's not the way to go. Yeah, 100%. Um, I think I definitely like hyper underline um, purchasing just less. And I think a lot of this is centered on just completely reshaping and redefining your relationship with consumption and your clothes on like a, a holistic level, um, but just consumption in general and treating your clothing sort of like you would like an art gallery, you know, like you don't like if you have a wall to like curate, you don't like fill every corner with art pieces. You pick a few things that maybe you invest in and last longer than like trash art, pretend this analogy works. Um, and But those all say something about you. And you know, and just like you appreciate each brushstroke of each painting, you also can appreciate each thread that has woven into the shirt. Um, and I think it is really important to like think very intentionally um, and maybe investing in pieces, but also purchasing less. So the amount of money that you spend doesn't have to change, but just the amount of things that you own could be substantially less. 
Um, but also, I do think that this conversation, um, I want to take one step back, and oftentimes it turns into like, okay, pitting poor garment workers in Indonesia against pitting like broke college students here, um, and like, okay, well, like, who who's suffering is like worth it? But I don't think that that's just the conversation. I think what it should be is like. Why are like the people who own Zara, Intedex, um, Gap, all of these like huge like corporations, some of the richest people on earth? I think that should be the question. Is like why you know if if why are the Notre Dame was literally rebuilt by fashion people while the rest of the world is on fire and their own garment workers can't eat? Um, and so I think we have to also redirect our focus less on this individual consumption. And, your, your individual choice is important, but like not really that important. Um, and like if you need to buy like something from Gap or like a, wherever, go for it, but also like be on the streets protesting militarism and protesting um, all of these sort of related entities to fast fashion. The reason why um, people have no choice but to work in a sweatshop in Indonesia. The reason why um, Zara's owner is one of the richest people on earth. And I think that allows us to then think about fashion more inherently politically again, but also on a more holistic level and less sort of the focus on an individual, but more a movement of what we can do to actually change something um, on a global scale. Thank you. Um, I want to talk more about, uh, you know, the side on representation and the media, um, but yeah, so I guess like this transitioning question um, for Kim, maybe. Um, do you uh, have an input or can you talk us through the process um, of designer houses um, from the very, you know, design of their collection to the runway, um, sh to their runway shows? Like, how does it work in terms of culture? Um, what is their approach to diversity? Um, could you oh. tell us more about it? <laughs> How does the fashion industry work? <laughs> How much time we got? Um, uh, so I guess getting to the heart of the matter, would, it, would your question be more about like the thought process of fashion houses or fashion brands when it comes to cultural representation? Yes. Uh, in the design sense or represented in ads and on the runway or internally? in terms of the workforce? Because um, there's various aspects. Fr from the very, like, if, if you got to speak to the designers, uh, I'm really curious to know, you know, how they want to represent their collection, their clothes. Mm -hmm. uh, some ways to tackle this, and um, I'll do my best to express all the different kind of wheels turning. Um, so those of you who are not in fashion um, get an idea of what's been going on. Um, like the reason, well, I guess starting in one angle is um, when I started working with Gucci in February, uh, it was all because um, Alessandro Michele, the designer of Gucci, was inspired, as they all are, as all artistic genius are, um, last year to design a balaclava sweater, the sweater, eternal neck sweater, I think most of you saw it, that goes kind of over the face. And it was inspired by the Australian performance artist Lee Bowery, who Lee Bowery um, would have this kind of um, clown face. Um, and so it'd be like face painted white, sometimes black, and then a big red painted mouth. That's what Alessandro was going for. And so what ended up happening from concept to design to production was a sweater that was red mouth on yellow, red mouth on purple, red mouth on white, red white on black, wait. And so that's when the black sweater ended up out on the runway and Twitter got a hold of it and all that was uh, communicated to the mass audience was Gucci's out here making blackface sweaters. And so Alessandro's like, no, 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 that's not what's happening. So, um, but it was too late, the damage was done and what did not help was that a couple of years earlier, Gucci had sent down the runway a black model wearing this sort of voluminous leather jacket that looked just like a jacket that was designed by Harlem legend Dapper Dan. Um, and Dapper Dan, just as a quick side note, um, African-American man living in Harlem, 1970s and into the early 80s, he designed pieces that kind of um, poached logos and materials from designer brands, these aspirational designer brands, um, and crafted, like a true couturier, 
um, these pieces that were not officially Louis Vuitton or not officially Gucci. Um, and it was all to kind of bring luxury to Harlem because fashion didn't want anything to do with black folks and didn't want anything to do with Harlem. So he was bringing it up there. So it had this profound significance. Um, so when he was concocting these pieces um, from his own imagination, and then 20 years, 30 years later, it ends up on a Gucci runway, you know, there's people who remembered that and said, wait a minute, that looks just like a piece that Dapper Dan had made. And there's no credit there. That's the problem. There was no credit or there was no note that it was an homage. And so when people saw that, they already, Gucci was already on their radar with, you know, they don't care about us. They, you know, they want the art, but they don't want the people. And so then, fast forward to last year when um, the Balaclava sweater comes out and then things come to a head in February of this year, people just thought these people are insane. They just really don't care. And so then, a couple months after that, there was the Sikh um, incident where there was this turban that went down the runway and the Sikh community was upset because it was a white model coming down the runway with this blue turban and they just wanted to call attention to the fact, to Gucci, that look, you know, some of us really have to defend the headwear that we wear for religious significance. You know, it could be a matter of life and death or just being harassed on the street, and you're just putting it down the runway on a model like it's nothing. Um, so a model that doesn't even look like us. So Gucci had all of that, um, all of those issues going. And so by the time I came in, I was brought in by Marco Bizzari, the CEO and president. He, they flew me to Milan a few days after meeting me and asked, can you do a lecture on cultural awareness and sensitivity and why blackface, the iconography of blackface, the history of the iconography of blackface matters, why this is a problem, why people are outraged. So I gave a lecture on that and then he just hired me as like an internal professor for a while um, to help them. And the things that I learned, the quick takeaways, was that, you know, I kind of came into it upset, frustrated, and then after encountering these people and being at Gucci headquarters and being at this company, you realize I'm not making excuses for them, but much like other uh, multinational brands and global companies, is they're very homogenous in terms of their culture. It's like glaringly white, it's glaringly Italian. So as I'm giving this lecture about something that is just so painful for one group of people, you know, there's just sort of these looks of, wow, I didn't know that, you know? And so some of them actually did not know. There's blackface in many parts of Europe is just so pervasive, you know, they just don't think anything of it. And didn't realize, you know, because they're not around, um, black people on a regular basis, how problematic it is. And so having my black self in there telling them and letting them know was really helpful. Um, and so one thing when newspapers and magazines always like contact me about, hey, there's a new thing that happened in terms of cultural appropriation today or uh, you know, some new offense has happened, why does this keep happening? And for me, you know, I hate to sound like a broken record, but it's a lack of education. There needs to be education, first of all, within these companies. Um, so, you know, there needs to be more of me continuously educating them. It's not just a one-off lecture and then calling it a day and thank you for enlightening us, this will never happen again. It has to be a culture shift on the inside. It also needs to involve um, a diversity, more seats at the table, I guess you've heard people saying, um, a more diverse company. If you want the coins, if you want the money from multinational, if you want to be a multinational company and brand, and you want money from all over the world, then you better start reflecting the world that you're trying to uh, market to um, within your own brand and company, because it's not going to work having an all-white Italian brand um, trying to promise us that they're enlightened in terms of cultural awareness and sensitivity. This is going to happen over and over again. Um, so, so those are just some of the things. But on the flip side, you've also got people who are so frustrated saying, I don't care about a seat at the table. I'm tired of this. I don't want a seat at your table. You clearly have no respect for us. We're going to build our own table. So that's part of the discourse also. So um, it's not just begging for a seat at the table. It's, it's been very complicated. But um, in terms of workforce and then design output, um, that's what's been happening in terms of cultural awareness and sensitivity. There's been a lack of it. And so no education and not enough diversity and inclusion. 
Um, do you feel like the um, fashion houses, you know, they're being more political also in their clothing uh, with like, you know, political statement on their clothes? Lip service. It's just pandering. So that was my question. <laughs> how, how do you feel about it? The woke movement, activism. It's I call cool. it revolution washing. So if everyone knows like greenwashing, um, so greenwashing is basically like H&M saying that, oh my God, we have a sustainable collection. We are so progressive, um, which A, then how are the rest of your clothes made? But then B, it makes you feel like H&M is like this leader of progression and like so sustainable. And like if you think about a sustainable fast fashion brand, H&M is probably comes to everyone's minds. Um, but it, it just like washes all of your crimes that you're actually doing. And revolution washing is like what, this kind of the time that we're in right now. Um, and like everyone wants to be a part of the movement, um, but it's not at all. It's like it's so far from it, because corporations will never define what the movement is. And it's like what you're saying. You know, th none of this means anything until there's actual systemic change mm -hmm. within the brands. So just going out and putting a charter out there, saying this is what we're doing, guys, or putting it on a T-shirt. Everyone should be a feminist. It's, it's that's like nine hundred dollars. The Dior one. Yeah. <laughs> Also, it probably made it a switch up. Um, but also, I think something else that's just like really frustrating um, is that people are buying all of it, like they're, they're eating it up. Um, and particularly, I feel like communities of color right now, we're like really trending. Um, our identities are like super sexy right now. Um, but like, and only to the extent that they can use our faces, but not what it means to actually support a person of color, not what it actually means to support a Muslim person. So like Nike, for example, has actually won awards for the Nike Pro Hijab and come out for like being so for, like from, for Muslims. But again, who's making these Pro Hijabs? It's Muslims and sweatshops. Um, and the same with like the rest of all of these brands. And so if we really want to talk about supporting Muslims, why don't you start with your sweatshops? Um, and also then taking up space and like completely, like Muslim women have been making hijabs from like the day that we have been wearing hijabs. So like it, that we've been having this industry. Pro hijabs are not a new thing. Muslim women have athletic leisure hijab wear. Um, and so it's really also that the sort of like allowing us to also see these brands as like seeing us and like representing us. Um, and I think that it's working because we've also seen that Nike sales, despite the fact that there have been huge right now sexual harassment claims against Nike at so many levels. Um, has anyone heard of them? Yeah, you know why? Because Nike is a progressive organization that loves Kaepernick, or Kaepernick, I always say Kaepernick. Kaepernick. I always said Kaepernick. Um, and so actually because Nike has endorsed Kaepernick, um, people view Nike as a progressive brand. And so all of these sexual harassment claims, they're not even making headlines. Um, and so it actually is changing culture and the way in which we're allowing who can define what is good civil rights. Nike is saying this is what it looks like to be in the civil rights movement, it's Kaepernick. Don't burn things down, don't like do anything more than that, but like this, this is what we'll like agree to and if we can all like agree on that, then our movement can be here, like we're leading the revolution. So it's destructive because we're also, as like community organizers, um, the bar has just been so like lowered. Like if you just wear a shirt that says I'm a feminist too, you're automatically a fucking feminist. But like that's just, it's so ridiculous because we're completely erasing all of the significance behind what it means to be part of something bigger and actually organizing around these issues. Because Nike, that's part of their brand to be disruptive, just do it. They love just, you know, a renegade on the surface. Mm -hmm. um, but also if I could be petty for a minute. Please. Um, <laughs> um, Another slice of that is, you know, and I apologize to anyone who buys into these brands also, but so there's like the blatant injustice that you're talking about. And then there's also, I just have a little problem with sort of also the, the brands like the one-to-one -one model and these brands that are really excited about being benevolent and they, their advertisement campaigns always have like a really happy brown person who's just so happy that they came over and gave them an opportunity. And so they love showing that off in their ads. So they're like, we're sustainable, we're here for the people. And there's usually like, and more, more often than not, it's like a wealthy white person who just got really inspired and caught up in the spirit. And she decided, found herself on her trip to India. Yeah, it's like this eat, pray, love, and decided to kind of like help all these women. And so the ad always has like these really happy smiling women and they're just so grateful that this person created this brand for them and now you also can smile walking down the street with a sweater that's um, ugly but, can we also point <laughs> out that nothing ever looks good because it's never designed it's just like some white girl something. who's just like it's the symbolism behind we're it. gonna so like knit shit you know because i just wonder in terms of justice how are you really empowering with these one-to-one -one models like tom shoes um someone i believe who's from texas like i am you know just creating these things like 
it's like, I don't want to slam the intent, but we also but the have, intent. <laughs> we have to think about, you know, it also keeps, you know, the heel on the neck of these people in terms of like actual agency or creating their own economy. Um, when you keep these kinds of brands intact. Um, it's like back when I was an undergrad in anthropology, I'll never forget, it's like over 10 years ago, I got really angry in class arguing about the red campaign. I, I found it so problematic as an undergrad. Throwback. Yeah, throwback, like red, you know, where it was like red shirts, red with the gap, that gap? red, everything. Red was collaborating with everybody. And so it was just so such basic passive sort of activism because you just got to buy a red product and just said, well, I saved the world today or helped these people. And, um, you know, I, I feel a little less terrible. Mm. Um, but, you know, I, I just don't think that's the way. We've got to push harder, which is, and this is kind of moving um, into not really slow fashion, but really fast fashion. Um, that's why I was a little excited, but I know this could be complicated, and I also invite anyone in here who may be from Rwanda or know someone from Rwanda to chime in. Um, I was really kind of excited two years ago, two summers ago, when the president of Rwanda kind of pronounced, like, we're not taking your anymore. You know, we're not taking shit. Yes, we're not taking it anymore. <laughs> so fast fashion, all Got the you. stuff, all of our damn t-shirts that say, but first coffee, you know, all that stuff. Last year's super, you know, so. Um, <laughs> super Bowl shirts strike yeah, again. <laughs> all this basic stuff, you know, that we're done with. And then it goes to the thrift store, you know, it goes on its journey, doesn't make it through the thrift store, ends up in this bin that is packaged up and sent to Guatemala, or, or in this case, Rwanda. These companies have to take our stuff. And the president of Rwanda said, we're not going to do that anymore. We're going to kind of build our own economy, our own kind of cottage industry, kind of try to stimulate a fashion industry here. Um, and it was symbolic. It was saying to the EU and um, the US, you know, we're not l literally taking your junk anymore. You know, we don't need your you know, one-offs um, or your, your discards. Um, but it's also complicated because as I was reading more about it, you know, in Rwanda, you had some people, some Rwandans who were really excited about it and just saying, yes, you know, it was just such an act or a gesture of self-determination. But at the same time, you have these kind of micro-economies that happen in these countries that take these discards um, where they kind of pick certain items and then they kind of resell them in their own little marketplace. So some of them were feeling like, thanks, you know, they felt like it was shots fired and thought, now this is going to come down on me. What if I'm someone who only survives off of reselling all of those discards? What am I supposed to do? And then you also had some people saying, you know, for the emerging designers coming out there, you had Rwandan designers saying, well, I want to make expensive dresses or pieces. And so some people thought, well, that's going to be cross prohibitive if now I'm only limited to wearing Rwandan fashion. So, um, so that's sort of like also what's happening in the discourse in terms of fast fashion, what's happening with it, um, and how countries now are denying taking all of our discards. I mean, aside from that, we also have countries like China take, saying, we can't recycle any more of your stuff anymore. It's a US problem, among other countries' problems, but US in particular, you know, people can't recycle our stuff anymore. Countries aren't wanting our discarded clothing anymore. So, you know, we need to figure this out because we just can't stop shopping. For some reason, we just can't control ourselves. Um, talking about state involvement, we've talked a lot about private companies. Um, I want to ask a question regarding uh, freedom of speech through fashion and um, the way you dress. So the US Supreme Court in 1969 recognized that you could protest through wearing a black um, armband um, in the case Tinker and Des Moines. Um, how do you feel today in this country? Um, how free do you feel um, like expressing your ideas and thoughts through fashion? Mm. And, and then I, I'll, I want to ask also about hijab. <laughs> and that's, that's a, another. Um, well, since the latter part might relate more, so, so I'll start. Um, I, you know, as much as I complain about the US and our, our, our inability to stop shopping, um, you know, it, it's tough, especially when you're a black American. You know, there's this freedom that I take for granted oftentimes and that I enjoy being able to express myself whenever I feel like it. Um, 
But, I mean, also, like, with what I teach in my fashion and race class, I, I kind of suggest that before you put on your clothes as a racialized person, the first thing you're wearing, so to speak, is your black skin or your brown skin. And so, you know, you're dressed in that first. You're dressed in your race that society and history is assigned to you. And then you've got to work out your identity by putting clothes on top of that. And so you've got that whole kind of conversation happening. And in terms of, so in terms of freedom, um, I don't know, it's an ongoing practice um, that sometimes we take for granted. When you are dealing with racism or you live within a racialized body, um, there is a lot of labor going on. Mental labor, physical labor. You, on a day-to-day -day basis, you're thinking about, huh, you know, I'm going to this space and then this space. Do I want to wear my hair straight or should I wear it natural? People are going to get uncomfortable if they see my hair naturally, so I guess I'm going to have to straighten it. So then you have to go through this whole process of buying the hair products or maybe going to a salon and flat ironing your hair, blowing it out, and doing all these things just to make people comfortable. Or if you decide to embrace your natural hair, then you just have to feel like you have to be on the defense and really protect it. Um, so sure, we are free. You can wear your hair naturally if you want to, but within workspaces or just on the street in everyday encounters, um, there is this labor practice of putting yourself together and defending your style, and then also um, just sort of the act of, you know, um, I think that's just where I was going, you know, just having to figure out and work out um, how you want to express yourself today. It's not as free as it seems. Um, but in general, yes, we do enjoy a great deal of freedom here. But it's complicated. Uh, how do you feel about uh, wearing a hijab here? Um, so in France, like we have. Uh, oh, we know. <laughs> <laughs> and then soon to be like Montreal, right? Yeah, they already the Quebec charter. Is like Quebec is already. So yeah. Yeah. So, yeah. Well, Islamophobic. Um, yeah, this is a really interesting question. Um, I think first. Freedom is like a trigger word almost. Um, what does it even mean, especially given that, like I, I think it's always important to contextualize like a privilege, but then also the fact that we live on an active empire, like America is literally an empire, like currently, right now. Um, and so what does it mean for us to experience or like be happy with our freedom when we're actually the reason why many countries are currently in turmoil? Um, like I was trying to keep it like together on the car ride over as Iran currently has protests all across my country as gas prices have gone up 300% because largely in part to US sanctions against Iran. So, um, and we're seeing protests across the Middle East. And so these, the, the, we always like to compare like freedoms in America and liberal democracy to like authoritarian Middle Eastern like dictatorships. But the binary is not something that I'm comfortable with and I think that we have to contextualize like the turmoil in countries globally because of this quote unquote freedom and so is actually freedom if the rest of the world is living um, in chains that the United States has put them in. So I think that that's a context that I want to first sort of ground ourselves in. Um, secondly, I think that sure, yes, I have the ability to wear a hijab, but that doesn't necessarily mean that the state is not going to use that against me in terms of surveillance campaigns. Um, CVE, which is the Countering Violent Extremism Program by the United States Department of Homeland Security, actually has hundreds of thousands of dollars across the country that uses hijab as an actual conveyor belt on the road of radicalization. So in Boston, um, in, I think New York City is fine, but beware. Um, in Chicago, Minneapolis, which also particularly black Muslims are affected, um, we see the US government pouring money into or, um, this program that allows guidance counselors who get trained in like um, bystander intervention, like cute little like words like that, um, that when you see a, like a Muslim girl going to school one day without a hijab and the next day she wears a hijab, she's on the conveyor belt to radicalization and so you have to report her to the FBI. And so sure, you can wear your hijab at school that day, but that doesn't mean that you're not about to be on an FBI watch list. Mm. And so I think if you don't walk outside of your house every single day not having to think about what you wear, that's privilege. Um, and a lot of us don't. Um, I'm, I mean, in Oklahoma, I was physically assaulted. My hijab was pulled off. It was horrible. Um, and that doesn't happen to the same extent in Chicago, but that doesn't mean that you still have to dress yourself in a way that you understand that the state has surveillance against you. Um, other people, racists, are going to like pretend to run you over with their car. Oh my God, so funny. Um, 
but also like there are a lot of like a, a, and that CBE program was actually built off of failed gang prevention programs. So the gang database in Chicago, for example, if you're a black male sagging your pants on the south side of Chicago, you can also be added to a gang database like that um, without even having to speak with you. And so our identities are sort of hyper politicized, whether or not we want them to be. And sure, we can sag our pants if we want, but that doesn't mean that we're actually going to not face real political um, results of that. And so I think that it's really important to sort of contextualize that, um, yes, like it, we, we do have like the ability to dress, but that doesn't necessarily mean that that's a freedom that um, is fully expressed, nor does that coming at the cost of the way that the rest of the world is also mm -hmm. suffering under. So, I mean, also, for example, America uses fashion all the fucking time um, as an excuse to invade other countries. So in Afghanistan, for example, one reason why America gave, um, it was oil, it was definitely oil, but one reason that America gave was that they wanted to save these brown women from these angry brown men. Um, so because women were wearing hijabs and oppressed, obviously, and we weren't wearing miniskirts, we're not free. And so to oppress us, you have to bomb the shit out of us. This is America's foreign policy. So um, America actually uses miniskirts and hijabs as a political framework for bombing the shit out of women. Um, and so this is absolutely ridiculous, but this is actually the way that the government looks at um, or it creates media around invasion and war um, and the destruction of lives. So again, I think that it's really important. Like I think freedom is like such a, a tricky word to like have a conversation about because are we really free when the rest of the world is on fire because of this quote unquote freedom? I'm glad you said that also because just intersectionally speaking, especially in terms of freedom and feminism of just women feeling like, oh, you poor thing, you must be so oppressed. I know. You know, and so there's this ongoing narrative of also of just, you know, we have to take that off of you and, you know, you need to buy People have into, actually said yeah. that to me. It was ridiculous. Buying into modernity and, uh, you know, American citizenship and freedom and happiness is stripping yourself of those things. Mm -hmm. And that's, yeah, that's completely false. Um, I have a very broad question, um, and then I'll leave the floor to the audience if you have questions. I'm sure you do. Um, what a decolonized fashion industry look like to you? Uh, what, what are your hopes, like midterm, long term? <laughs> I would say, <laughs> if it's more. Um, for me. Um, I guess in close with my work as an educator would be education. Um, I'm doing my own work on the ground, like Hoda. Like, um, it's really been sort of, it's been exciting to be able to kind of take things, ideas, originally in the classroom. I mean, I actually didn't have that broad of a perspective. I thought, oh, I'm just going to teach these classes and, you know, great. And I didn't realize that that work could end up saving brands like Gucci, you know, of helping them through an issue, actually enlightening employees. I've spoken to over, I've taught over, over 600 Gucci employees at this point, um, and just basic lectures of um, what kind of brings our humanity together in terms of um, harmful imagery and understanding what you're inspired by. It's okay to be inspired. But just knowing, you know, the significance of those things and the repercussions, possibly, um, and being an advocate for greater diversity and inclusion, I work so closely with students and really the next generation of fashion designers. So I hold that to my heart because, also as a person of color, those students of color look to me and think, you know, can you help me? You know, my professor doesn't understand me. Um, you know. Th you end up becoming a sort of a therapist also in some ways. And, you know, and I'm not complaining about that, but they just, they start kind of confiding in me all of the barriers that they're dealing with in the classroom before they can even graduate. And, you know, first professor's not understanding them or saying, I don't, I don't know about that for a final project. That's not fashion, you know? And then once they graduate, it's because they're not in the cool network so they don't enjoy the white privilege that their classmates have. Next thing you know, they've got all these, um, barriers to getting internships and jobs um, because their friends' buddies have all kind of helped them get jobs. Um, or the company just doesn't see someone like them working for their brand. So then they just get stuck after they've risked it all just to be a person of color deciding to follow their fashion dream. So really trying to advocate, protect, support those students has been um, a mission of mine. 
educating brands and companies, any, anyone that'll let me into their doors and kind of, you know, just helping them in terms of their inspiration and um, where they're going design-wise. Um, and then, you know, most recently it taking me to um, the Netherlands to be part of a think tank. I had no idea that in Holland there was uh, the Volkenkund Museum, which is uh, the museum of people, basically. It's an ethnography museum, and my background's in anthropology, and I was just kind of astounded that in 2019 there's a museum that is really like a giant diorama of all the peoples of the world. So there's Asia and Africa, and, and, and so it's like an actual museum that just sort of reduces and packages up groups of people, all of the world's diversity, into just these little exhibitions. Like how do you... White people talk in the museum. How do you convey an entire continent into one little small gallery space? So, you know, we have this two-day think tank discussion because there's a fashion curator there now where her job is going to be integrating fashion exhibitions, dealing with textiles, anything that's like headwear or adornments. Um, I was invited along with like eight other scholars so we could sit there and think, how can we rethink this whole <laughs> gallery, like the whole museum really? Um, and sadly, though, um, long story short, what I ended up learning is I appreciated that the curator, who's white, was so concerned in inviting us to have a good discussion about how can we undo all this? How can we redo this um, and not be so reductive in the ways that we kind of showcase the world's cultures? But um, she also revealed, sadly, that her hands are kind of tied because we were really preaching to the choir that day or those days when we had this think tank we were all scholars from around the world who were on the same page in terms of decolonization. But she said, you know, this is really great, but the people over me at this museum, the marketers, they want something sexy. You know, it's just, you know, they want that anthropological perspective. And so as much as she's trying to push back and try to integrate our decolonization suggestions, the marketing team and the people who run the museum aren't really that interested. Um, they may think about it, but um, they just think, well, we would have to change the whole mindset of a whole group of people. Visitors come there to see the ethnography of it all. You know, we want to see someone just reduced and collapsed into just, this is what people of the Pacific wear. You know, so it, it is a daunting task, you know, because it's not just about changing the museum, but a whole group of people in the Netherlands of what they expect when they walk into these museums. But these are just some of the things. And then also working on this charter for Camera Moda in Italy, the fact that they let me in, I just like went to town writing all this radical stuff in there, changing this, changing that. So um, perish the thought if they hadn't, you know, I'm not saying I'm the person who should have done it, but a person of color, if they had not asked someone, um, I don't know how radical this charter for all the Italian brands would actually have been. And I'm thankful that a friend of mine who is a, um, author and champion of sustainable fashion who's white, she was actually offered to do it. And she told them, you need to bring in Kim Jenkins. And so I was like, thank you. And she's like, you don't need to thank me. And I thought, no, actually, that's what allyship looks like. You could have easily just said, oh, I'm going to, you know, I'm going to take the money for this. She could have easily just done that and just cut me out. Um, so that's what allyship also looks like. So these are just some of the things that's, you know, part of this conversation. Um, yeah, I think education is a huge part of all of this. Um, and I think that, to, to I guess kind of end on like a, a little bit of a hopeful note since I've been like, burn everything down on Pencil now, um, which I do not take back. Uh, but I do think that a lot of where I see progress coming and like where I would like to see the industry is for us to be able to truly understand the fashion industry in a global and intersectional way. Um, being able to understand and sort of uplift the voices of garment workers who are systemically silenced in every single aspect of everything that we do and all of our movements. So we can understand that like we don't necessarily, again, it's not about an individual choice about where do I buy or where do I not buy, but like knowing how the military and militarism is connected to garment workers how policing in prisons in this country is connected to garment workers. And if you're worried about the environment, you have to also be worried about the US military. And you also have to be worried about garment workers. And so I think we have to th be thinking about all of our issues truly intersectionally, and not just like, I show up to your protest and you show up to my protest, but knowing that like 
we literally cannot be free as a people, or even as like people in this country, until garment workers are also free. And so we've actually truly been able to challenge the fact that this active empire is taking people um, and putting them in exploitative positions. And people around the world are suffering so we can buy a $5 t-shirt. And if we don't actually look at this on a, syst like a systemic and holistic level, um, then that's going to be difficult. To, uh, and we're just going to have like surface level reforms. So I think what is beautiful about that though is that we are also not alone. Everyone who's right now organizing, we're organizing for the same thing and we're able to really pinpoint and work together to create something that's bigger and more beautiful than just one issue because we know how deeply interconnected everything actually truly is. Um, the fact that, for example, U.S. military uniforms are produced now in Afghanistan after America bombed Afghanistan and there's no jobs left except sweatshop jobs that now the U.S. military can make uniforms in. So it's all connected. It literally is every, like, everything is literally connected. The fashion industry is one of the most destructive industries to the environment. The United States military is the number one most destructive thing in the environment. And so how can we, again, sort of think about whatever, we're, whatever we care about right now, connecting that on a global scale to the other issues that we can then also work together then to be challenging and it's not just like us and ourselves. Thank you very much. Um, let's thank Oda and Kimberly. And um, I'll open the floor to you guys, if you have any questions. Yes? Uh, so thank you both for coming today. Um, so I was wondering, would you, um, would you agree that what's really unsustainable is our intense demand for shopping, and that fast fashion is a supposed solution to this demand? And if so how can we reduce this demand? Wait, could you repeat that question? I was sure. just really excited that there are mics in these chairs. So yeah. um, would you agree that what's really unsustainable is our intense demand for shopping and that fast fashion is a supposed solution to this demand? And if so, how can we reduce this demand for, for shopping? Wait, is the question, is fast fashion the answer to a consumer need of sustainability? Right. No. Um, I think it's the opposite. Yeah, so I think fast fashion is something that's actually pretty new. So fast fashion um, has not always existed. It's not always how all of our clothes are made. It's only the clothes that fall apart that's made in fast fashion. Um, and so it's a pretty new phenomenon that has just like really like capitalism on steroids. And so I think people seeing this and seeing how deeply destructive that this industry has been to global communities in so many different ways, I think people are starting to now give a damn and like be like, oh, wow, maybe we should care about waterways um, and maybe we should care about the earth um, now that it's on fire. So I think that right now sustainability is trending, but fast fashion has existed well before the sort of current, I think, trend of sustainability. Yeah, and it, it says something that worries me because, you know, we can have this conversation, but at the end of the day, especially when it comes to students or just everyday people on the street, um, I mean, I guess, like, you know, when I talk about this with my students, we get excited and you know feeling empowered about the right ways to consume but then we also realize for the students they say but my relatives my my aunt or my uncle they don't care about this or that you know they just need to you know just get an outfit to get you know from point a to point b or someone is just needing an outfit for a job interview so it's it's really difficult because it can immediately turn into this sort of this elitist conversation um, of what you should be wearing um, because it's nearly impossible for for um, many of us to just walk out the door and never you know uh, buy something that isn't related to fast fashion um, so I'm not sure you know I, I, I'm encouraged by the fact that we have been able to create change and a little bit of guilt um, through the use of plastic straws um, through the use of plastic bags so it is my hope, you know, it, and that has all been from advocates and activists pushing, 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 experts, uh, marine biologists, all of their work for years, pulling the numbers together and laying it out there and saying, this is what plastic straws is doing. You know, look at these islands of plastic and waste. So I'm hoping that somewhere down the line, hopefully sooner than later, fast fashion, you know, will also be part of this conversation that we can um, have sort of these massive campaigns for that, you know, kind of make fast fashion the next plastic straw or plastic bag. And you actually kind of wondering, okay, what else can we do? 
Um, but the solution isn't going to be to withhold all of a sudden fast fashion from people because that's going to hurt um, people in a lower class. So it, it, it's a tightrope that we're walking. Um, so for right now, that's the best that I can answer to that because it's, you know, one person's going to suffer. You know, we have to be very surgical about how we address this. <laughs> Don't make us do we'll it. Let you <laughs> no, but we can hear you. Okay. But can everyone? Yeah. Oh, okay. now it works. Great. Right. Just turned on. Hi. Um, so thank you so much for your talk. I come from a different world, so it's really great to hear everything you're talking about. Um, so my question comes from a concept that we are using in medical education where we're switching from cultural competency to structural competency. Mm -hmm. So a lot of that is kind of what you guys are talking about. Instead of just like looking at one aspect, we're looking at it holistically and seeing what are the different levels that are kind of impacting. And so um, my question is coming from this idea of structural competency and seeing is there a place for it in fashion education and when you're going to talk to these companies and recognizing that you know we can't just talk about how these garments might culturally be offensive but also how these garments are placed in this wider structure of basically oppression and um are designers being educated in these and can are, can you even go to companies and open these discussions with them hopefully i mean in working on this charter that's supposed to come out December 3rd from Italy, I mean, this is just from Italy, I mean, it's still a little surfacy um, in terms of actual structural change. I added text that they accepted from me of, like, this is systemic, this is all due to systemic oppression. I'm shocked that they let me, they, that they kept that in there. And so, because it was not in there. And so, in terms, so they're taking a crack at it. Um, so, like, their charter is going to talk about HR, which, you know, they're trying to address that of, um, from this top-down management, it should be acknowledged that, um, like, for instance, one thing they have in there was just a simple sentence saying, um, there, we need to deal with diversity and inclusion in all levels of management. And then I put in a hyphen, particularly executive and creative <laughs> leadership. Let's, let's, let's make it plain here. Because, you know, like, oh, we have plenty of black employees at the Gucci stores. <laughs> but, okay, fine, in the retail stores. But when you start moving into the C-suite or creative direction, this is, you know, where it happens structurally. You know, when you have a lack of diversity, cultural diversity, um, ethnic diversity, this is how those things happen. I got phone calls earlier in the year from people who found out about the work I was doing with Gucci, and they were just like, I'm going to be anonymous. I can't tell you the brand I'm working for, but this is what's happening right now. Help me. And so it was a person working for a luxury British brand that will re remain <laughs> nameless. But she was just basically saying, I'm the only one. And something really messed up just happened in our design team. And I feel like my hands are tied because no one will listen to me. And I'm just kind of afraid to speak out because it's hard being the only one and I don't want to make waves. So what do I do? Um, and so, so... All that's to say it's complicated, and then you've got some brands trying, just now acknowledging, huh, maybe this is structural, <laughs> like you think. And so um, I have hope, you know, that maybe now that we're having this conversation that the major brands, like under Caring and LVMH, like Saint Laurent, all your top, Cartier, all those brands, are going to start to realize this, but it's going to take time for sure. Um, Though in the fashion system, we've got some radical fashion brands, indie designers, who understood this yesterday, and they've been trying to say that, but, you know, kind of in the grand scheme of things, um, they don't have as much power. Mm -hmm. but, um, but I'm hoping that that is going to be the way, and it's helping that there's people of color or people who have been left out of the conversation or away from the table so long are getting invited in to help talk about that and let them know this is structural. This is, these are the solutions. And just really quickly also is that I, and I think that I'm, I'm hoping that the artistic, like the endeavor just for the artistic aspect of fashion allows brands to actually legitimately grapple with these issues. But I think it's also important that we contextualize that brands in this world are also after profit. Mm -hmm. 
And so it, maybe it, they're not actually interested in a structural level or they're just maybe like we'll play the game just so long as like it lets them pass through then our communities and get our money. So I also think that it's important. Stay relevant. Yeah, so I think it's important that we also like even look at brands, especially like very large brands with a critical eye always, even when they're trying to say that like they, they are, even if they have the words to express structure, that doesn't mean that like they're doing anything about it if they're still fucking billionaires, right? Mm -hmm. Billionaires should just not exist. I just, I'm very vehement about that. they don't feel like they have anything that. at stake. You could literally you like a, you could literally solve world hunger, and every day you wake up and you choose not to. Like billionaires should not exist. Like I'm, have I'm very strong in that opinion. <laughs> Hi. Um, okay. So I wrote down my question because it's confusing, um, and it kind of confuses me. Um, Kimberly. Yeah, be a question uh, from Iman. Pardon? <laughs> um, it's just a lot of layers to it. Okay. So I'm glad you brought up Dapper Don because I remember that jacket and. Um, if I'm remembering it correctly, it was unique enough for him to file um, some sort of like copyright on it. So he could have technically sued Gucci. He didn't. Um, so I'm wondering if part of the solution to like diversity inclusion is great. I also think that's something that's really trendy. Um, so I'm wondering if the solution is actually just more ownership. Like why should a company like Gucci get to profit off of um, culture that they need to be educated on, right? So it's like you have people who actually create culture um, is part of the solution to um, you know, sweatshops actually just giving ownership back to the people who are on Gucci's mood boards. Mm. That was not a complicated question at all. No. <laughs> so in get so it, in like why didn't he just? I'm, I'm trying to think. Like, it, it's like Gucci and Zara, and it's like yeah, like Gucci is like the mm -hmm. Right. Um, making it so that, yeah, responding that in a cultural way. I um, took my students a month and a half ago there for a field trip. I teach this class right now called NYC Fashion. It's just like all things New York fashion. And um, my students actually, I'm the only black person in my class. <laughs> all my students, no one's black. And so I thought, this will be a great teachable moment. Let's all go to Dapper Dance Atelier. And those students were very critical. Um, so Jelani, Dapper Dan's son, Daniel Day's son, was sort of our leader along with Robert, uh, I believe Smith, who uh, help runs the atelier. Um, they had to field all of these very critical questions from my students. I told them the backstory. So the students all kind of came in there with their arms folded wondering, well, this is nice. This is great that Gucci wrote the check for this atelier. But th th the overarching question for my students was they felt like his wings were clipped a little bit. They thought, wait a minute, and they were just kind of doing the calculus of it all. But if you guys funded this, can he design whatever else he wants, including not Gucci? Because back in the day, he designed, you know, he made Louis Vuitton, his own Louis Vuitton pieces or Gucci, uh, Fendi pieces. And they felt that now he's sort of beholden to Gucci, and that worried them. That really concerned them, and they didn't think that was freedom. They didn't think that that was sort of a, a compromise or a win for black designers. Um, of course, Jelani and the team at the Atelier says he can do whatever he wants. Dapper Dan can do whatever he wants. He is not, he doesn't owe Gucci anything. But the students were very skeptical of that. And so that is, like what I was saying earlier, part of this other conversation of, um, you know, we've got, like, we're sitting on gold, as what I was saying, you know, it's like really sexy to work with, you know, anyone who's marginalized or a person of color. And, you know, we shouldn't even be considered just marginalized people on the margins. We're the ones that are the source of coolness in many ways, of art, creativity, flavor, vibrancy, that these brands are just feeding off of like a utility, just siphoning off of it um, for their inspiration and giving no credit back in return. And so what's the damn deal? Like why are we not creating our own brands or spaces? Um, it happened in the 90s. It was like this renaissance as I see it with streetwear and uh, sometimes just called urbanware, streetwear. Um, you had these sort of brands coming out or streetwear labels where it was like for us by us so april walker fubu um carl Kanai, cross colors all these brands coming out saying 
we're just going to create our own thing. You know, we don't need to be validated or justified by any fashion brand. Um, but something happened in the early aughts up to today where, and, and some of the ways I think about this, you have like designers or you know, um, hip hop artists like Kanye West and ASAP Rocky who now have become muses instead for the brands and love just like dropping like, you know, name dropping um, European fashion brands, which they were doing in the bling era of the 1990s also. But there was just still this aspiration for being accepted and seen by European fashion brands and sporting your fa those brands. And so, you know, why not do the whole Tyler Perry um, channel of like creating your own table, beyond creating your own table, creating your own empire? Why, what's holding us back from doing that? Empire, imperialism's back. Yes, yeah. Absolutely, and this, and not to go too a far off tangent, but I had a similar question when I was um, engaged in a guest talk or like visit via Skype with my friend uh, who I graduated with, Vanessa Rosales, who got a degree in fashion studies with me uh, and moved back to Columbia, and she now is bringing fashion studies courses to Columbia. And so I spoke to her class, and some of the students were saying, what do we do when there's sort of black Colombians on, literally on the margins selling you know, braids, like selling their own material culture, braids, um, jewelry pieces, these garments, to white tourists. You know, they have no choice. They have to sell their culture to white people. Um, you know, and the student was just really conflicted about that, thinking, well, where's the power there? Now you have to just sell your own stuff to a group of privileged people, um, and then they go home, you know, showing their cultural capital, their social capital. Of, Look at me, I went to Columbia and I got my hair braided and I got, you know, I, I got these earrings from, you know, these people. And so where is the equity there? And that's why cultural appropriation is such a heated topic. But also I think that it, it like it's hard because a lot of, like I think that um, this is coming at a time where like, as you mentioned, like we haven't felt seen. And so now for the first time that Nike is like putting a hijab on a model or like, you know, like, like people of color are getting faces of magazines all the time. I think people are excited about that. But I think it's also, and just as you say, so much more important now for us who this, like, who these advertisements are targeted toward to also stand up and say no. Like, um, and I think a lot of what we can do is like be very uncompromising in who we are um, and make sure that those brands know it. So like in your purchasing power, whatever, but also like speaking out um, and like writing or publishing or creating that allows Nike to know that like if you want to support Muslims, you can't make your hijabs and sweatshops. Um, if you want uh, to be supporting the black civil rights movement, then you also can't be using exploitative labor of black people in Africa um, to, in order to like harvest the raw materials for your thing. So I think it's important for us also who these ads are directed toward to also kind of have agency in that as well. And I think it's difficult, especially given um, Americans are so America centric. And even as like, as a daughter of immigrants, it's even hard for me to think beyond like borders unless I am actually like physically outside. And I think it, it's difficult to get people to realize that we are privileged at the end of the day, that like, sure, yes, it's great to see a hijabi on television that's not like being called a terrorist and like that's refreshing, but also like at the end of the day, that representation is coming at an expense to our people still, just like you mentioned. So I think it's something that we have to have nuanced and complicated conversations about. Um, and it also gets complicated because, I mean, I, I do think that we should be supporting our own people and like being able to invest in our own communities and our local designers, um, but also without like the idea or the goal of like wealth accumulation again, you know. Um, so like for example, Beyonce has that Ivy, Ivy, 
Ivy Park, thank you. Ivy Park line, um, but that's also made in sweatshops. So I think we also need to be critical about our own people and hold ourselves accountable too. And like, how can we create um, art and fashion as an art without having capitalism strip it away, without having exploitation destroy it, and without having like other people's faces wear it and walk it down on the runway. So I think these are really important conversations and also why fashion is just such a great conversation and like a way to have all of these very complicated conversations because it affects all of us every single day when we turn on our TV or open up a magazine. And it's complicated because she's a capitalist first. I mean, we could problematize Beyonce all day. Um, but added to that, you know, I mean, Gucci made attempts to kind of make matters right with um, their change makers program, which they were doing before the blackface issue, but um, you know this. So one thing within the change makers initiative they had is, um, and you may or may not be satisfied with this response, but um, they created a scholarship program, a very generous scholarship program to p to presumed students in need, um, targeting ethnic or students they see as ethnic or raced. Um, to give them opportunities, and then also these channels, like the mentorship program. Um, it's several cities around the world, um, from like Nairobi to Harlem, where they're going to create a channel for fa young fashion designers so that they can get like a straight line to Milan, um, like an internship. So there's no more wondering, you know, how am I going to get there? You know, there's no way. I have to go through this whole labyrinth just to make it into, you know, Gucci. So those are some of the ways that they were doing it. But again, it's, yeah, it's layers <laughs> of but complication also, yeah. because also there's designer brands that we could do. I do see people, you know, like Chantrell P. Lewis and her husband created this Shop Black campaign and website. But, you know, it, it's complicated and this is, these are the vestiges of colonialism and racism and internalized racism. You can set that stuff out, but there's, you know, people of color, uh, black people who don't want that. They still aspire to the European brands or to whiteness. And it's not enough to, you know, support, you know, your brother or your sister and the brand that they're creating. It's not aspirational. I, I had a phone conversation with a journalist, black journalist, who said, you know, Kim, honestly, if I pitch an article and Essence accepts it or Anna Wintour and Vogue accepts it, I'm going to go with Anna Wintour and Vogue because they matter more. And he's like, I hate saying that. Oh, Hoda was it like uh, revolution? What was it? Yeah, revolution like, watching. Revolution how, watching. Yeah, like how it can really hurt someone's reputation and stuff like that. I was saying, this is like trash fashion, you know? Well, like not even trash fashion, but just like fashion practices in general. Like it is really hard to like keep that. So like when you talk about like the Gucci performance and like the art being made in Gucci, like there is there's theories of that. There's people actually believing that who think you know. I think that they put this noose around the model's neck with, you know, the baby hairs and everything on purpose, you know, just to um, get attention. And then, you know, they then try to resolve the issue. But now at least that name's on everyone's, you know, lips. It's on the radar. And, it, you know, any press is good press. Um, there's some people who actually believe that. Uh, even some people who've revealed who work for some of these fashion brands believe, even working for those brands believe that that is the case. I'm not sure. I don't know if I can make that call. I don't know what's going on in their heads. But um, I, I mean, at best, it's profound ignorance. At worst, it could be, you know, intentional. So I'm not sure. Hi. Thank you both for sharing your knowledge. So I work in the fashion industry. I'm a design operations assistant, Eileen Fisher. And I realized that myself and many of my peers, especially people of color who are starting off in the industry, are frust frustrated by how fucked up this entire fashion system is um, and don't really want to continue working in it. Mm -hmm. But we're told to work in it, make your way up in these unsustainable, unethical companies to get, to get a seat at the table 10 years down. Um, and so my question is, um, even then, will those few change, what will those few changes that we can make when we get there 
what will they do and how much change will they actually create? Um, and because of these questions, a lot of people of color are actually leaving the industry, um, and that leads to less people in those seats at the table. Right. So um, what advice do you have for these recent graduates? Um, and do you think it's even possible to work within a system that we're complicit in because we're earning an income through it? Um, yeah. <laughs> that, that's so complicated because I've had a conversation actually in the last month and a half addressing each of those things that you just said with um, one recent graduate. He called me wanting to talk. I was like, I got 30 minutes. An hour and a half later, you know, we're talking. And I mean, he's almost in tears um, because he went to school here and he said, what gives? You know, I applied to 10 different places like Coach, Gucci. I, ma I make it into the second interview and nothing works out. I do the whole song and dance. I have a portfolio. I, you know, I have an MA now in fashion. Why, you know, now I'm back home in North Carolina. I don't know what I'm supposed to do. Why won't this system accept me? And, you know, he feels that race has something to do with it. Um, his voice. I mean, all these little things. Um, because it's a culture within those brands. It's a culture of, can we see you working with us? Are, you know, d you know, do you reflect our values and, you know, can you blend? Yeah. And so there's those issues of, that we're seeing sort of an exodus of people of color saying, you know, I don't want to be part of this system anymore. And, you know, you've also got some people of color who are staying within those brands and feeling very conflicted because they almost feel complicit with some of the things that's going on, um, from magazines, fashion magazines, to major fashion brands. Um, but I mean, that is the big question. Do you stay? Do you go? Do you make the money and try to make a little wave you know, within the company um, and sort of disrupt the status quo and add some color to the representation? Or do you really want to go through all that labor? It's up to you. you know, do you want to go through all the work of doing that and trying to make a systemic change within that company? Or do you want to strike out on your own um, and just change the fashion system by doing your own thing and constructing your own fashion system? It generates more questions than answers right now, but this is what is actually happening as we speak with a lot of students just saying, I'm tired of this. Yeah, I definitely think that it's um, a really difficult question given that everybody is in a different space and might feel comfortable like in different situations or may not and it's you can't necessarily say like everyone should leave the fashion industry right now you know so I think that there that being said um, personally I think that in the fast fashion industry reform is impossible because like as we mentioned as my abolitionist perspective on the fast fashion ind industry indicates is that the industry itself you can't reform from the inside from the outside the industry requires violence and regardless of where you are in that totem pole you're still complicit in that violence um, non fast fashion by non fast fashion fashion is a little bit different um, given that fashion is art and art isn't inherently violent um, but I do think that we have to also think about our end goal um, and like what are we actually trying to like push for um, and is this brand actually valuing more from like having a hijabi on their staff than like what I'm actually getting like as a paycheck coming home um, and so I think that these are really really difficult questions but also very personal ones as well um, and sometimes for me I think that they they can be sort of akin to almost electoral politics and um, and I have less experience in the fashion industry as I do in community organizing so I'm going to draw a community organizing parallel and hope that it applies but something that I think that we can learn um, so much from the black uh, the history of blackness in America is um, and that's obviously as like an immigrant that's where I look to for like histories of resistance and struggle is that um, the the sort of the the movement for black lives not currently but sort of in the civil rights movement um, and it was getting so much traction and so much ground until a lot of the leaders of the black rights movement would start going into politics um, and we saw the movement then completely fall apart once people were starting to like enter electoral politics um, and the same reason why Obama, when he was elected as president, was required for the Black Lives Matter movement to begin is because you can have a black person be the face, the highest political power, have the most like both representation and literal power, and still you can have the most number of black people shot and killed by the police in your country. And so I think seeing that history 
makes it really clear that when an industry and a system is not built from you in the beginning, no matter how many faces that look like you are part of that system, that doesn't mean that you're not also going to continue to have your people be at the end of that system. And so that history for me is really important, which is why like, I don't engage, like, I, I don't like, get people to like, vote for whoever, I mean, vote for Bernie, but um, aside from that, <laughs> I don't like, have a lot of my, I don't invest myself in electoral politics because I don't find my liberation coming from people in electoral politics because I know the system was never built for me. And so I think that we have to be asking these questions and looking at where our histories or histories of other people can show us the root in our own industries and our own lives as well too. So that's something that I think that you're gonna have to make for yourself and we can talk about it after if you'd like more. Um, but it is, it's a deeply personal one, so it's not one that I can give you an answer for, but I do think that it's so important that we ground ourselves in something that's also bigger than ourselves and look at our history that's extended from before our ancestors as well to learn from that. And one thing I just wanna add to that, tack onto that really quick is like logistically, especially if you want to be, uh, or so in fashion design? Uh, yeah. Um, you know, it's also complicated because it's such an overwhelming, unwieldy, well-oiled machine. Um, you know, it is built to be oppressive in one way or another. You can't have it both ways because when it comes to making things scalable or mass producing things, how are you gonna do that, you know? How do you afford, how can you afford that outside of the existing system? So it can be done, but then that's when the costs become astronomical of just thinking how can things be slowly made or if a thousand people love a shirt or a tunic or a sweater that you're making, how do you go about doing that? Because um, we start having all of this kind of outsourcing become popular by the early 80s and having these super designers like Ralph Lauren, Calvin Klein, Donna Karen, who kind of modeled what's possible um, in terms of mass producing and getting your name out and licensed to the world. And you know, if you wanna go in the opposite direction and make things more slow and smaller um, in smaller batches, um, it's just, it's very complicated and difficult knowing how to kind of put together the tech packs on your own and get everything outsourced in a way that's cost effective. Um, there's uh, new organizations or companies like Cala, C-A-L-A, that is now trying to disrupt that. I don't know if they're being that disruptive, but they're trying to embrace um, and attract small brands or small designers and say, let us help you with all of the logistics that can seem really overwhelming for you if you want to strike out on your own. And we can help you with how this whole system works. But still, like, and going with what yeah. you're saying, you know, how do you make things scalable? That's what, you know, the business of fashion is all about getting your name out there and um, mass producing, and you realize it's incredibly expensive, which is why, you know, when we see things that are expensive, you get angry. Yes, a lot of it could be branding or just a logo or a label that they just tack on an extra thousand dollars for, but a lot of it's actually, you know, if you're like Aurora James, um, who has the brand Brother Valleys, you know, she'll argue, she'll get very frustrated if you complain about the prices of her bags and her shoes. Um, be she says, because I'm working, I'm going down to Africa to various countries and giving them a livable wage. That is why your, your boots are $600. So, um, so we have to take all of those things into account if you wanna kind of disrupt the system a little bit like she's trying to do. And I think also, sorry, um, I just think this is a really interesting question that hits upon a lot of questions that we've had also as well. Um, and I think that's something that's really important is that w I think the fashion industry is so systemic, like so institutional, unlike many other industries. Like you're either in it or you're out, or like one day you're in, you're the next year out, whatever. Um, and, but it doesn't have to be that way. And it really doesn't. And I think that it's so important that us, not just as people interested in fashion, but also in law and like business and everything that we do, we can literally imagine a radically alternative world and actively work toward building that. So for example, blue tin production, I didn't go to fashion school. I didn't realize there were two different types of needles until I started this company. And I think that it's so exciting that it still is being able to be like a, an actual alternative for what the fashion industry could look like. So I don't think that you have to go up like a corporate ladder um, here in the West to understand what fashion looks like. Our people have been doing fashion in so many different ways since the dawn of time. And so if we're able to like think about ways that doesn't even value the systems of capitalism or the systems of what we learn here um, and like our very like white and colonial education systems and be able to actually rebuild and recreate and reimagine um, what that could look like. So I think in the center of anything should be just like our ability to imagine and our ability to not be constrained within sort of like these very tight or what feels like very tight borders around what fashion can and can't be. And it might get uncomfortable. It should get uncomfortable or you're also not doing anything. <laughs> so we'll take one last question and then uh, we can pursue the conversation outside. <laughs> Hi. Hi. 
Um, <laughs> my name is Tutu. Oh, hi. I'm over here. Can we take two questions? Yeah. Hi, my name is Tutu. This is Amber, and we're both high school seniors, so this is really cool to see, like, what our future could be. Um, I find it really interesting, this whole idea of, like, revolution washing and using kind of this momentum of change and diversity as, like, a bandwagon. And I think, sadly, that's true for a lot of people we see at our school. Um, a moment that kind of shocked me was that, like, the climate strike, which is an issue of sustainability I really care about, um, like, the same people I was marching in the streets with for like three hours were then going to Dwayne Reed and buying like boatloads of plastic water bottles to drink from because they were thirsty and it was kind of like the irony was like lost on the moment um and other issues also kind of like supporting it for the moment for the Instagram story and then as soon as it's over not really caring about it and I think like we're very lucky in the sense that like we have access we can come to Columbia and like see amazing ta um, speakers and like see all this but there's a lot of people who don't have that access or don't care to use that access we have to. So kind of my question is, how do we, as not only at our high school, but as we go on to college and as we grow up, how do we sustain this? How do we not make this just a trend, right? Like sustain let's sustain the momentum. But sustain the momentum and get people to actually care beyond just I walked, I took a picture, I told my parents that I walked, I'm good now, I'm an activist. And how do we actually kind of implement the passion for activism because I think that's what's really needed so yeah how do how do you guys believe we can better sustain it for like our generations I don't know. let's figure that out together because honestly I don't know I'm gonna be honest and I think that's something that we all need to figure out um, and I think that that's sort of a similar question that has almost I feel like rung a little bit um, throughout the Q&A is like how can we actually do something not just like once or twice or like a reform but like how can we actually change something um, and I think that that's something that we have to think of together. Like, I think that we should talk afterward, or I think that it's really important for you to understand, like, who these people are. Like, why do you care? Like, why, why do you care beyond an Instagram post? That's actually, yeah, go ahead. I'm okay. curious. Um, I think it's just, like, honestly, the way I've grown up, like, my parents, that sounds kind of ridiculous, but I kind of always growing up, it's never been, like, activism's not something you enter. It's always something that has been a part of our lives. So it's not, I never really thought twice. And I think, like, not to, like, call Amber, but, like, Amber, like, being friends with Amber and other friends like that, like, that have exposed me to such issues that I didn't know existed in the world and how, like, interconnected it is. I guess, like, that's why I'm an activist because, like, I am I know I'm really lucky to, like, be able to go to the school I go to and be able to attend these talks and just, like, be surrounded by people who care and kind of, like, like I feel like I have a responsibility to make other care, care too because if there's, like, I'm, I'm a very small voice and, like, I'm 18. I don't have a lot of power, but in everything true. in my power I can do to try to make other people care, that's important because if we don't do that, who else will? And I think, like, not to talk, but, like, activism is still something I kind of struggle with and, like, how – like my places and like my identity, how that plays a part into it and like where I'm coming from and how much more I have to learn because there's so much more I have to learn. So I think like that's something I kind of like think about every day, but like I guess I'm an activist because I think like if no one, if I don't, if, if I don't try to play a part into it, like if I don't try to be a part of bigger than I am, like something bigger than I am, like what does my time really, not to get like too philosophical, like ooh, Go but, for like, it. but like, but like what? Crisis at like, 18. No, yeah, so sorry. but like, it not really, because like I'm, I'm so, I, I was born so lucky with so many things and like if I don't do my part to try to help, like like what has my time really meant? And I think like it's something I really, in, and I don't know how selfish that is like like in trying to like, I don't know, like I like deal with these questions like clearly a lot, but I don't know, like I'm an activist because I think like I should be and I think it's important to be. And I think, like, my parents, my friends, my community has kind of installed that in me. And it's something that, like, I take pride in and I try to better every day. So I don't know. Like, do you have people, um, do you have visibility online, like social media, where there's, like, a great deal of people seeing um, your agenda well, or I'm, your concerns? <laughs> I want to say I'm Instagram famous. No. <laughs> <laughs> but not even famous. How many but... followers do you have? What are your impressions? <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> um, I can show you my statistics. No. Um, I, like, I try to. So, for example, if we were both on the um, inclusivity board at my school. So something we've tried to do is implement kind of in school. So um, one of our major things this year is like, she, Amber can, Amber's the co-head of the board, so she can so start. It's like, but we wrote an open letter to the entire like community at our school yeah, with yeah. a list of initiatives that we want passed like to better 
like the relations between students and teachers like mm -hmm. in terms of like um like issues of bias within the school and also like implement like structural changes like to recruit and retain more students of color and like hire mm -hmm. more teachers that are better representatives of the yeah. student body as well so we're trying to approach it within the school when did you do this uh, just, just this year we're like publishing it in our school newspaper soon. just recently yeah. yeah it's the first year that like like Inclusivity board is really trying to go ham. I mean, this for lack is great. Of a better word, but and you have to be patient. <laughs> Our students should be learning from you right now. Yeah. How many of you have done something similar? <laughs> Getting that out there, and then again, I mean, I don't want to be like too Pollyanna about it, but it's just like social media has enabled, you know, a tremendous platform for various agendas and campaigns. And I honestly believe, if you know, you have maybe it's an Instagram or some sort of social media account mm -hmm. dedicated to just that, mm -hmm. you know? And the, the key or the recipe is just staying consistent and relentless and not letting people forget about it because that's when people just start kind of losing the faith in it too. Um, when, you know, the best activists, especially young activists I've seen, they just pick, pick their agenda or their campaign, their issue, and they just keep posting about it relentlessly, mm -hmm. always. I, there's a woman uh, who's a designer, Tabitha St. Bernard, um, who's a fashion designer, but she's also an activist. And she's just never not posting about that. She'll post pictures of her kids, but then it's in her latest collection. But still, every single week, she never lets you forget, oh, the immigration crisis, mm -hmm. or kids in cages, or you know, like all these different issues that a lot of people are just thinking, where should we go to brunch, you know, <laughs> like this one. She's just saying, no, you know, I'm going to interrupt this daily programming to let you know that this is still happening. You know, just because you went to this march or something last year, this is still an issue. Mm -hmm. So, you know, if you really stick with it and just, you're just kind of relentless, um, the momentum's only as good as your energy. And so um, as long as you still find it relevant and keep posting about it, people will see that and think, wow, these women are doing this in earnest and, um, you know, maybe we should address this issue. Uh, it'll, it, with time and patience and just really laboring it, um, it'll come. People will kind of believe in it just as much as you do. Yeah, and never think that you're too young to have a powerful voice. Like what you're just doing right now, talking about systemic change at your school, like that's amazing. Like that's really, really important. Um, and you have something important to say, so it doesn't matter how old you are, how young you are, but like as long as you're getting your voice out there, I think that's so important and like you're able to hold on to that. So that's really beautiful. Um, and I also want to commend you on like all of your badass work. Like that's amazing. Um, that's really important. And I think I want to say two things. So I think it's really helpful to like meet people where they're at um, and understand that like you mentioned, like you had the, the privilege of having family that has been supporting you and really being able to sort of lay either the, the language or the framework for you to have a better understanding of how the world is so interconnected. You have this fabulous friend sitting next to you too, who also helps. Um, and so I think that that's really important to also know that like not everybody, as you know, like has come from like similar backgrounds or situations. And so um, it's difficult to even understand or have the language to understand these issues. So trying to meet people where they're at. That being said, it's also, I think it's important to know when to stop trying to get somebody to understand where you're at. Um, once someone is like negating your very humanity, and I think that you don't have to, not everyone is gonna agree with you. Um, and I think that we have to make decisions for ourselves where we have limited time and we have limited energy, like all of us do. So we have to decide um, where we wanna invest that energy and if we wanna invest that on building community with people that are already on our side and we can build and imagine and like really work on something or getting every single person who maybe prop, like maybe their parents are part of Shell or something, you know, like you don't know. <laughs> and so like someone who like genuinely is invested in profiting off of this like same thing that you're fighting, are they really, um, is that where your energy is really gonna be worth it? So I think it, it does get also better when you're, as you also mentioned, is sort of as everything is connected and understanding how environmental um, justice is related to racial justice and anti-militarism and like fashion and all of these things and you're already building that community and that's really important. And it's so helpful to just be grounded and like rooting yourself within a community that is larger than yourself and with people that already get it and I think that's really helpful. Because when I started out um, on my own platform, um, I first started by like trying to like trick white people into thinking about politics through fashion. Um, and that's like a whole story in and of itself. But I, at one point I realized that my community doesn't even have this language. Like I've spent so much time trying to convince white people that Muslims aren't terrorists. I forget that my people are still struggling with mental health issues. My people are still struggling with like 
thinking Nike hijabs are cool. And so I had to make an intentional shift over to where I saw that my energy was more needed and more focused was like building within my community that's already there. And that felt also just so much more wholesome and so much more re-energizing. So I wasn't just like giving, 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 but also like receiving and building something. So I think it's also a, a sort of a conversation about when do you also let go to. Mm -hmm. Thank you so much, Kimberly Jenkins and Oda Katabi. Thank you all for okay. coming.